Welcome everyone. This is a video in which we are going to talk about UPSC mains paper for 2019 for ethics. This year's paper were not, was not a big surprise. There were questions which were expected. Also the line of questioning, the nature of questioning was very much like last few years. So there were no big surprises, at least in section A, there were not big surprises. Uh, and also what you can see is it was evenly spread out number of questions. Everything was pretty much repeated like last couple of years. And in that sense, I don't think candidates would have had a great difficulty. Uh, what was slightly difficult this year is uh, length of the questions. The questions were lengthy. For every question, uh, candidates had to write a lot. Uh, and in addition to that, questions are becoming more factual based, uh, also sometimes even more theoretical based that you need to know some theories in ethics in order to understand and write about those questions. We'll see each question one by one and try and understand uh, how to deal with it. Uh, one uh, small thing before we start. Uh, in these answers, you will see that uh, for few questions, there are only some pointers, some bullet points. For some other questions, full uh, answers, full sentences are kept here. That is also that many times we face that students who are appearing for mains would have understood the topic, would know what the question demands. However, putting it in articulate sentences is a challenge. And so uh, that sometimes becomes difficult. So there are full sentences which will appear here and that is there for you to read. If you think you want to make notes, you want to read about it more, you can pause the video, uh, read the content and then again listen to it. Uh, it is done intentionally so that it helps you understand how to articulate answers because every subject needs its own jargon. It is true for ethics also. And so these are the answers. Let's see what was the question number one. Question one was, what are the basic principles of public life? Illustrate any three of these with suitable examples. This is a very common question. Either they ask for values or they ask for uh, principles of public life or qualities of civil servants. One of such questions you can always expect in the beginning. Uh, here uh, we have given accountability, integrity and transparency. Now, uh, what should actually be the uh, nature of this answer is this 150 word answer. So I'm going to say that you evenly spread out these things. So 50 words for each uh, sub point that you're going to write. And even those 50 words you can arrange very, very methodically. So one is definition of what you're going to say. Uh, second is example. A relevant example and if possible how it is related in Indian civil services. So uh, these are the things that you can write in each of these three points. Again if you can't write the uh, importance of it in civil services that is still okay because uh, you have only 50 words and sometimes to write definition and follow it with example might take 50 words itself. Uh, here another thing is, um, it is my sincere suggestion that when you pick up definitions, if possible, pick definitions from a very reliable and also I would say uh, authentic source, for example, for integrity, for transparency, for accountability, uh, not for transparency, but then you could have taken definitions from Nolan Committee report itself, or you could have taken definitions or explanations which have been given in second ARC fourth report, rather than going to any other source, any book that might be, say, let's say, is like writing their own definitions, because definitions available uh, in these reliable, relevant, uh, authentic sources are valued much more. There are two reasons why you should write definitions from such sources. One is those definitions are generally good. They're better than what otherwise people randomly write. And second thing is, it also tells your reader, it tells also, also tells your evaluator that you know what are the authentic sources. You know what is the core competency of that subject is. So there are various reasons why you should take definitions from more authentic sources. Uh, in the easy question, let's move on to second question. This is 1B. What do you understand by the term public servant? Reflect on the expected role of public servant. Now here, this is uh, very basics of uh, uh, public administration and ethics, the cross section of public administration and ethics. Uh, let's see, you know, the answer should contain, you should start with definition again and 
follow it with what are the expectations now here what you have to say is a definition of public servant not generally for let's say civil services but in any public servant and there are some commonalities between all public servants for their expected behaviors here again if you uh, did know about uh, do's and don'ts or conduct rules by santanam committee that would have been excellent um, so let's see uh, it says civil servant works as a custodian uh, of the pro public responsible and accountable daily civil administration civil servant is expected to be honest upright incorruptible unbiased responsible empathetic empathetic uh, professional so now these are the qualities directly expected from the civil servant but then you need to also write some of the uh, detailed answers like some of the detailed uh, expectations for example uh, civil servants are supposed to work for weaker sections of society uh, minorities because although they are considered to be agents of state they are supposed to represent best interest for public so that is what is also expected uh, of civil servants and this all was required now again it would have been fantastic if you could end this question with some kind of example a civil servant that you know now although it is not asked if you can if you write it in a sentence that will be really good uh, moving on next question this second question a effective utilization of public funds is crucial to meet developmental goals critically examine the reasons for underutilization and misutilization of public funds and their implications now here uh, the biggest uh, thing to understand is not generally write about corruption because corruption is often associated with uh, misappropriation of funds or misutilization of funds but talk about underutilization and misutilization of funds itself because corrupt practices are different than just not being able to use funds properly although uh, there might be some commonalities again with corruption and misutilization of funds the question just asks you about utilization of funds that is also a clearly cut out part in your uh, syllabus so i'm sure people who are studying would have studied about it um reasons for underutilization and misutilization of public funds is interdepartmental communication gap there is often some kind of communication gap duplication of work by numerous departments this also happens lots of times lack of commitment by the state or central government to follow fiscal prudence now here uh, this is an age old question about whether policies are good or bad or whether implication is good or bad and here you have to point out in case of funds what happens is also that the the policy making itself sometimes doesn't show enough Uh, uh prudence the, and then that's why that's why things go wrong the next part of this answer was what are the implications so if you have such kind of reasons and then underutilization of misutilization happens what are the reasons and what are the implications so this is the implication part <clears throat> it creates surely creates pressure on public exchequer uh, it causes imbalance in the fiscal health of the government which may lead to fiscal emergencies like the balance of payment and current account deficit it weakens the government now these are the things that should be discussed thoroughly in your answers because why is ethics important why is uh, ethical practices important because they cause uh, such kinds of situations they that that are irreparable in near future now weakening of government is not is generally seen by common people very quickly but it has very long lasting effects and ethical practices are important because the more we neglect them the more problems which are not easily seen by common people are going to arise also um, it may lead uh, to state or nation in debt trap cycle this is a uh, this is a basic economic uh concepts that there are continuously your uh, the nation goes into debt and so all these sort of depends on policy makers and executors of policy knowing what are the good fiscal decisions and how to then also utilize allocated funds so this was the question here again um if you had any direct examples of misutilization of underutilization of funds you should surely talk about it only caution to exercise here is please do not write anything which is in recent past where the verdict of the court has not been out where we really don't know who was right and who was wrong but in something which has gone which has happened some years back some decades back you can surely refer to that next question 
is non performance of duty by a public servant is a form of corruption now you can see that both question 2a and 2b sort of are in are looking at the same direction but then taking finer positions in that this is very important for anybody who is uh, attempting ethics paper to understand that all, both the questions might look like corruption questions but then they are not here this is an explicitly a corruption question while earlier was a funding issue so non performance of duty by a public servant is a form of corruption do you agree with this view justify your answer now generally you can write something about corruption what is your understanding of corruption and also see that uh mistakes do not just happen because somebody does something wrong when people avoid to do good work that also is considered to be mistake that also is considered to be a uh, part of corruption so this is for as kind of sin of omission that was it is called there is something called a sin of commission sin of commission is when mistakes are done when corruption is done by taking a bribe by asking for a bribe while sin of omission is when you halt good projects which are in public interest uh because of some personal gains or you uh, give out contracts give out tenders to uh, like you know it has been given out to people who are who might not see the best interest for public but then you don't say anything about it so these are all sins of omission where lack of action itself can be a corrupt practice now there are a lot of examples even in recent past where you can see that that where action has not been taken that itself constitutes corruption moving on uh third a what is meant by term constitutional morality how does one uphold constitutional morality now generally all ethics questions will have two questions in them sometimes even three questions so one needs to be careful that while writing you divide your answer clearly between the first question and the second question so constitutional morality has come to refer to the substantive content of the constitution that is to say that constitution should work for people and not the other way uh, around it is there for people uh, so that procedures are helpful so that the democratic practices are there for people and not to threaten people to be governed by a constitutional morality is to be governed by the substantive moral entailment any constitution carries so when you say substantive again and again it means pro people it means meant for people uh, as against to procedural so you might have also seen it as procedural democracy versus substantive democracy and uh, when we talk about morality it is that part of constitution which constantly says that people's interest public interest is should be considered with the highest regard uh how does one uphold for a public officer constitutional morality uh, and not public morality should guide his or her decision making this can be done by imbibing and the constitutional values and ideals mentioned in the preamble and dpsp uh, now again here you can take some case for example here uh, we have written about let's say a case of homosexuality now um if all citizens are to be seen as equal in in the eye of constitution that should be followed in letter and in spirit and so how does one hold it that even if something is against your personal belief but the law says uh, the constitution says that these are the values that you need to uphold as an officer within the circle of your professional work you are expected to uphold those values and one could have written about caste system one could have written about gender there are lots of issues that could have been written here uh, this was 3a 3b uh, was what is meant by crisis of conscience how does it manifest itself in the public domain now this is slightly a repeated question there was earlier a question about uh, crisis of conscience and how do you solve it was the earlier uh, question what is crisis of conscience and how do you solve it i think it came in 2013 uh, here they are asking how does it manifest in public uh, domain now what do you mean by crisis of conscience is there is a, there is a voice within you which tells you about right and wrong and especially if the wrong has already been committed there is a voice which tells you that what was done was wrong so for example if one has already committed an action but fears it was an immoral action now the conscience is in crisis because it either it failed to make itself heard or was completely absent so while you are acting either that what is right thing to do that voice was not heard by you or that that voice was not there at all 
and so in other cases sometimes conscience also guide conscience sometimes also guides you to do something very evil and now you are in crisis about how to correct it how to bring your inner voice to the right thing that is required to be done this was the first part of the question how does it manifest itself uh, while holding a public office is um, let's say something is wrong but then it appears to be a norm now what to do like you can clearly see that um, that that it up something which is grossly a wrong practice appears to be the norm in the society and public officials sometimes do not realize it is wrong because it is so commonplace it is everywhere a person fails to understand that there is something wrong a public administration might be often offered substantial bribes or cuts by unscrupulous elements so even if you don't ask for it it might be that it is offered to you and there is always some kind of personal interest at stake and so now there is a crisis about what to do the proper use of discretionary power rests on the morality of the officer exercising it so again where can you have a real crisis of conscience is because generally civil servants have very high discretionary power and that itself comes with some kind of trap because you have so much discretion to decide about what can be done how things should be done you need to have a very strong voice from conscience if it is not there generally it, you, the person will be in crisis this was the answer for the next part of the question let's move on to the next uh, set of questions this is 4a explain the basic principles of citizen charter movement and bring out its importance now this was an important question asked for the very first time there were some other questions which talked about citizens participation earlier year but then this is directly about citizen charter so one thing is uh, you all can find handbook of citizens charter uh, on an official website by government and find out some of the important points that it mentions other than that um, we just need to understand what it is a detailed answer is given here uh, it is to say that citizens have a crucial role to play in service delivery and when we want administration to be held responsible for quality service delivery there is a part that citizens also need to do so while administration needs to be aware and make procedures make processes which are citizen friendly which look after citizens well being there are some counter responsibilities with citizens to make sure that administration is delivering quality service now here there it has several dimensions it informs people what services are provided by the organization in this people get clarity about purpose of the organization so in any public organization if you walk in you can also think about public banks you will see there will be boards on either walls where it is written that uh, what are the services which are provided here on the other side it will be written what are the responsibilities of citizen who enter this public area uh, are there uh, it informs how to avail these services this removes procedural roadblocks faced by people while availing services again think of something very simple for example let's say bank timings are always written so nobody can cheat you on that bank timings are always written printed uh, on the wall on the shutter of the bank so that inside bank so that nobody should give misinformation about how the establishment is perform is going to perform and citizens can ask for their right it throws light on method of applying for services it removes middlemen that often exploit people because of their insider knowledge of the system we don't want these things to happen and so citizen charter is generally where you are trying to make public offices more citizen friendly and uh, to bring maximum efficiency but then there are more uh, points here it also talks about service delivery now there is actually a law has been passed about uh, service delivery quality of service delivery in 2015 along with uh, grievance redressal mechanism and so if you knew something about it if you knew about 2015 addition of law that could have been a very good example here it also specifies a remedy if the stated uh, promises are not met this is what i was saying uh, about um, the whole part of grievance redressal mechanism there are now offices of um, prg uh, public redressal of grievances and so you can talk about that also uh, also you need to say that 
all this is done so that quality of the service delivery will improve. This is not just a procedure for the sake of procedure, but in citizen charters are in place so that the kind of service that citizens receive when they walk into public offices will improve. And um, they, they generally focus, you want citizen centric focus than bureaucratic paradigm or administrative paradigm. So the whole idea of citizen's charter is to put citizen in the center and to make sure that services are and they're user friendly, they're easy to understand, procedures are not longish and all such things. Question 4b was about, there's a view that the Official Secrets Act is an obstacle to the implementation of Right to Information Act. Do you agree with this view? Discuss. Now here, please understand that RTA has been discussed extensively in past few months and so is Official Secrets Act. Actually, Official Secrets Act has always been discussed. Uh, let's see some of the details for those questions. Official Secrets Act 1983 has a colonial history attached to it. So one needs to understand that it is not something new, it is not something we have just made, but it has sort of, why, why are we having it difficult to be removed or it is an obstacle is also because it is age old, there is a purpose it has been serving and so it is very difficult to come out with a sort of a solution which is agreeable for all. It was designed at the height of British Raj so the whole idea is it has, it has some colonial history. So now there is a question about OSA. It makes sense to write something about it, as you know, so that the evaluator believes that you have some knowledge about the law itself. Um, and then it was in year 2005, right to information came. So this is some amount of history. And uh, now the problem is uh, when you have right to information and you want to make administration transparent, why do you need another act which withholds information? That's the whole conflict. This creates instances where provisions of the Official Secrets Act and Right to Information are, are at loggerheads with each other. That's what uh, I was just saying. This fundamental conflict occurs between OSA holds the philosophy of government secrecy, whereas the right to information will talk about transparency. Here the view, right view would be to achieve a balance between the access of information where sensitive information which could be important for the nation's safety and security should be clearly defined and articulated as classified. Now, actually in parts R uh, RTI does that because there are some departments which have been excluded from RTI where information can't be seen. However, the, the waters are still muddy. Uh, there are many times OSA has been used when information uh, when somebody wants to withhold information and doesn't want public to know about something. And so uh, after writing about some kind of explanations about why this is there, the whole idea was to say that transparency can always be a beneficial to public. However, it makes also sometimes sense if it is something about nation safety, if it is something about, let's say, uh, some nuclear energy, something that you want to keep secret also can have its valid reasons. However, having two laws which are ex which which sort of uh, are the proponents of exact opposite things does not make any sense. And that's what should be the conclusion. There has to be a balance between these two things. Next question is about moving on to the again parts of public administration and ethics. A direct question about what do you mean by probity in governance? Based on your understanding of the term, suggest measures for ensuring probity in governance. Now here, it was a very good idea to start with definition again and then move on to giving on uh, suggest measures. So generally, uh, what is known as uh, probity in public life, it means upholding the highest standard of behavior in decision making and administration so that the good governance along with social and economic justice can be delivered in society. It means being better. It means up, being upright, uh, following principles in public life and being better from where you are. So if you want to improve your practices in governance, you need to adopt some new practices uh, guided by some ethical frameworks so that there will be probity in governance. Now how measures are ensuring uh, these things? Now these are uh, again this has been extensively discussed in second ARC fourth report. It has been discussed in Nolan committee report. So what are the difficulties right now? Is temptation of indulging in corrupt behavior is very high. Also, laws are sometimes archaic and procedures promote red tapism. A lack of well-defined ethical framework is always there, at least for civil services. And a lack of swift prosecution of erring public servants is also there. Now, these are the difficulties. 
uh, what can we do to overcome these difficulties? Is implementing relevant citizen charters and grievance redressal mechanism. Again, here mention of 2015 law uh, would have been very good. Institutionalizing and communicating an ethical code of conduct to all public administrators with regular training. Now, I can see that some of you might be tempted to write more um, sort of measures which can be taken by individuals. But in mean, when you talk about such systemic errors, such systemic developments, the the answer that you write should also have a systemic solution in it. So it is true that individuals need to make change in their behaviors and their practices. It is also true that we need a change which is system wide. Establishing a swift mechanism for um, punishing corrupt public service servants through institutions like Lokpal. So one thing is to Lokpa, mention Lokpal. Another thing is to talk about 311, Article 311 of a constitution, uh, which is uh, protection to civil servants, which is also proving to be counterintuitive, counterproductive, because um, it was meant so that civil servants can work in a fearless manner, but actually it is benefiting corrupt civil servants more than uh, the, the honest civil servants. That's what at least what second ARC fourth report is saying. So one could have mentioned the whole debate uh, about uh, Article 311 of Constitution in a couple of sentences. This was 5A. 5B <clears throat> was about emotional intelligence. Um, the question is emotional intelligence is the ability to make your emotions work for you instead of against you. Do you agree with this view? Discuss. Now the question is about discussing. There is no one swift answer yes or no and generally it is my suggestion that do not start by start your answers by saying yes i agree with this view before you put forward your own understanding of emotional intelligence which i think is very very crucial um so emotional intelligence <coughs> so emotional intelligence generally is considered as ability to manage own emotions as well as others emotions it is neither suppressing emotional response nor getting carried away with the stream of strong emotions it's both and it can be either your own emotions or somebody else's emotions effective emotional intelligence would ensure that we channelize our negative emotions constructively to achieve our goals so it is often said that people with high emotional intelligence also are good at using negative energy to complete a task uh, sometimes when you are let's say when you are feeling very frustrated when you are very angry there are very very uh, Individuals with high emotional intelligence who know what tasks can be done when there is there is a feeling of frustration, where there is emotion of annoyance. Say for example, cleaning, cleaning your house, cleaning your desk. It brings out orderliness in life. It brings out control over life and it generally works to, let's say, lessen your frustration. And these are known methods when negative energies can also channelize, can also be channelized to complete tasks. Uh, then again, <clears throat> Uh, when you're talking about emotional intelligence, it was very necessary that you talk about empathy and general understanding of emotional intelligence, your own understanding that this was a discussed question. So you had to go slightly deep into understanding of emotional intelligence. Sixth question. Uh, this question I'm not going to uh, deal in very detail because there can be a lot of correct and good answers for these questions because this is about quotations. Uh, the question here is, and uh, this is what I want to uh, put the most emphasis on, is what do each of the following quotations mean to you? This is called as leading question. Generally, UPSC has only a couple of leading questions, either what do these sentences mean to you or what is their relevance in the present context. But then this is what I think all of you should know that before you start writing about quotation, please read the leading question. Please see what it is asking of you. Is it just asking you to write, what do you understand? What does it mean to you? How is it relevant in present context? So it is necessary that you understand the leading question first and then start thinking about quotations. There were three quotations this year, a very famous quotation by Socrates, an unexamined life is not worth living. So this is to say that human beings will constantly uh, scrutinize their lives and they should and you should always be better version of yourself. This is Socrates. Uh, and then you that is where the that is where the human life intended is. So uh, here again, what you can do is 
established that aspiring for happiness is very very universal and however happiness can be in materialistic things and if you are not guiding yourself your mind in proper direction one can become greedy this kind of, this whole uh, persuasion of happiness can be very very problematic for other people if you do not take other people's views into account so um, happy life also has to be happy life guided by virtues and also if there is no examination then it is difficult to reach truth and wisdom if you don't have truth and wisdom guiding you then maybe sometimes it is often guided by desires and temptations so a human life just guided by desires and temptation is not the kind of human life we are seeking but then it should be guided by truth and wisdom so that is what it is again it has to be followed by good examples uh, where you can say that how people completely changed their outlook towards their own life completely took up a different kind of way to uh, look at things and examine their life for what it is uh, you can uh, think about famous politicians uh, people uh, a very crucial thing is social reformers because they examined their life they thought of new ways of living it so you can talk about any social reformer here and that i think should be sufficient on the next question 6b uh, was a quotation by mahatma gandhi it says a man is but the product of his thoughts what he thinks he becomes now this is a this is a kind of statement which says that there's a power in thinking because man is a rational animal there is a way to uh, sort of logically deduce things not only that thoughts also guide your behavior and so if one seeks good behavior it has to be channelized from good thoughts this is where the whole idea is uh, a detailed answer is given here so it it looks at uh, looking at various experiences in one's life then understanding that uh, personal and social life of a person has a specific relation with each other then also mind is also a source for thoughts of individuals and ultimately the idea here is that outcome of an action is many times decided by thoughts and so if you are thinking in the right directions your thoughts will be good here you could have talked about superstitions that if new thoughts uh, are sort of introduced to you no new ways of thinking are introduced to you your behaviors will change and what you think actually will be your behavior the last question of this exam was again a quotation a long quotation by apj abdul kalam this it generally talks about harmony in the family which will ultimately reflect harmony in the nation i suggest if you haven't read the question pause the video for a bit read the quotation and then we can discuss uh so this generally applauds the family as a unit in society and it says that if families are united if families uh, learn how to be harmonious with each other because every individual is a different individual it will reflect in nations being uh, in harmony and there will be peace in world so the smallest unit of society that is uh individual and family they need to be in uh, in sync with each other in har in an harmonious relationship and that will be ultimately helpful now here again you could have talked about families which have done sort of ex exemplar work where families have understood each other they have understood each other's needs and wants and they have supported each other through that so uh, there are lots of examples from india also otherwise from all over the world where you had to talk about families where the members have supported each other to flourish better you can even talk about cricketers where they have been supported by family you can talk about malala yousafzai uh, and and as i said there are lots of examples up for taking this was section a of ethics paper this year as i said a pretty straightforward slightly lengthy for some questions however no big surprises i hope this has helped you a pdf of detailed model answers is attached in the description you can download it and read detailed model answers if you have any questions regarding section a of ethics paper please write it in comments we will try to answer as much as possible thank you so much press the bell icon on the youtube app and never miss another update from the unique academy Don't forget 
to like comment and subscribe to our channel stay tuned